developed a new method to chemically deposit a class of materials that has never previously before been deposited. What is the application for this? To power the world. If we were to cover the ground with solar panels enough to, to, to provide enough energy to provide for the entire global population, we would only cover about 2% of the Sahara Desert. However, thin film solar technologies have only seen efficiencies about 20%. This is where perovskite solar cells have come in as an emerging solar cell technology with higher efficiencies than ever achieved before, despite only five years of research, whereas other solar cells have been researched for decades. Perovskite solar cells operate with a perovskite layer, which are the light absorbing layer that separate the holes and the, um, the excited electrons. And then the electrons travel through the hole transport layer on top. And then the whole transport, or the sorry, the fluorine doped tin oxide on top to transport the electrons. The whole transports through the whole transport layer on the bottom. And the perovskite solar cells display high absorption coefficients, which means that they can absorb a lot more light per unit of material. This makes solar cells a lot lighter, and it makes it so insulation is much much cheaper. One of the problems with perovskite solar cells is the whole transport layer is extremely expensive. The most commonly used material is a bispirofluorine, and it costs more than 10 times both platinum and gold, which is more than 50% of this perovskite solar cell cost. Additionally, the only process that has been developed to apply this layer is spin coating, which at minimum creates 20 nanometers of material, whereas the most efficient thickness for perovskite solar cell would only be about 25 nanometers. This is where copper halides come in as an attractive alternative for a whole transport material. They're cheap, they're non-toxic. Copper iodide specifically has been shown as a whole transport material. However, it decreased the efficiency of the cells because there were physical deficiencies in how they applied this layer to the solar cell. So we offer chemical vapor deposition, or CVD, as a process to apply thin films. It operates through the sequential reaction between vaporized precursors. So first one precursor is deposited upon a, a substrate, and then the second precursor, which is a vapor, comes in, reacts with the substrate to create the layer of the second, and then this is open to more reactions to create like an AB, AB thin film structure. This makes it so the films are highly tunable, both by composition as well as physical thickness. And because it's a chemical reaction, it allows us to create thin films across uh, surfaces even if they're not entirely smooth. So we can reach trenches or high aspect ratio surfaces. Um, a really, really important application of this that's been life changing is nano chocolates. This is the new uh, fad diet or the diet. So CVD has been reported for a lot of elements. Um, they are shown in black. And the, the elements that have not been deposited by CVD are either spotted or striped because they are radioactive or toxic. A class of materials that has never been reported by CVD is the metal halides. And so if we were to develop a process to deposit metal halides by CVD, then not only could we apply these materials for perovskite solar cells, but this would also be a breakthrough process in CVD process in general for metal halide applications. This could be, this ranges from microelectronics, the pharmaceutical industries, to food processing. So the reason why it does, CVD does not work for halide compounds, take for example the bromine terminated surface, is because when a copper precursor comes in to react, the only interaction really is absorption. So when you try to protonate the surface to remove the ligands, even if the ligands leave, then the copper precursor doesn't have a strong enough interaction to be able to overcome the purging process that is used through CVD. This makes it so the thin films, when you purge out the byproducts, oftentimes you purge out the materials that you're trying to deposit a thin film with. Alternatively, copper sulfide has been deposited by CVD processes, and where a copper precursor ligand comes in, it interacts and bo actually bonds with the sulfur surface, and then by protonation, removing the acetaminate ligands, then we have a sulfur-copper sulfur surface, which, which can then react to create copper sulfide. What we propose is to use this copper sulfide deposition process, which has already been reported, then indirectly expose this to hydrogen bromide to synthesize our copper bromide films. This is shown to be thermodynamically favorable at both 25 degrees Celsius as well as 180 degrees Celsius. To do this, we used a custom-built Arduino-controlled CVD reactor, and how this functions is first a nitrogen carrier gas is pumped through the reactor to bring the copper precursor into the reactor furnace. 
One pulse of hydrogen sulfide is brought for one second into the reactor furnace, and these two interact and are allowed to react to synthesize copper sulfide. Once we have a copper sulfide film, we can expose this to hydrogen bromide, and then we obtain a copper bromide film. And to characterize this product, we can use scanning electron microscopy to analyze both the uniformity and the continuity of our synthesized film. This can be done by both top down to see the crystalline granules to see if they're really continuous or not, as well as through a cross-sectional to see if we have a film or just like little islands of crystallines. And we, um, the main parameters we operated on were temperature of both the copper sulfide deposition as well as the HBR exposure. So first, after a significant amount of trials, we were finally able to obtain a copper sulfide film. It's not entirely um, uniform, but we were able to, able to obtain a film. We exposed this hydrogen brom bromide to obtain our first proof of concept to see if our conversion process would work. And by XPS analysis, we can see the elemental composition of different compounds by the x-axis, which is how far we're etching into the film. And we want to see bromide and the least amount of sulfur possible because we want to be able to convert as much of the copper sulfide as possible to copper bromide. And in this very first film, we actually do see bromide in the film, which shows that our conversion process works. However, we still see sulfur through the entirety of the thickness, which shows that was, conversion wasn't complete. But this film did show that our process is applicable. And you can see within the SEMs that the films aren't very uniform. So that was our next parameter for improvement. To improve this, we changed the deposition process of the copper sulfide to 180 degrees Celsius and did a study of the number of cycles. And so from 300 to 1,000 to 2,000 cycles, we can see that the crystallines continue to grow. This indicates two things. First, that our copper sulfur deposition actually works. Like it, as you increase the number of cycles, you can increase the thickness of the film. Also, though, that the growth is actually, it starts with centers that are not entirely just like, it's not like snow on top of each other, this very thin uniform layers. Instead, it starts at just um, certain centers and then the certain centers grow, which means that we need to be able to combat this agglomeration effect to create more uniform films. We exposed this 2000 cycle film, which is the most dense film, to hydrogen bromide, and it created really interesting properties of large crystalline granules on top, whereas a smoother surface on the bottom. To characterize what was in these films, again, XPS analysis showed that there was bromine throughout the film. We still saw sulfur, um, which was interesting because we didn't know were the crystal granules the sulfur or was the bottom layer the, surf layer the sulfur. Um, to answer this question, we conducted energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, EDS, which allows us to locate the elemental composition specifically on the film. And by comparison to the SEM to show where the granules are, we can see that the, both the copper and the bromide are most concentrated where the granules are shown on the SEM, which shows that the large crystalline granules are copper bromide, whereas the bottom layer seems to be the sulfur. So what seems to be happening is an agglomeration effect of the copper bromide, which if we even it out, maybe then we would be able to, be able to achieve like a more uniform copper bromide film. So that's what we did. We realized that maybe if we decrease the temperature, copper ions are extremely dis, uh, diffusive at higher temperatures. So maybe if we decrease the temperature, then they're less likely to agglomerate and create these large granules. So at 60 degrees HBR exposure, we do see a more uniform film. None of the huge crystalline gran granules anymore. And from a cross-sectional view, it seems like they're starting to grow into each other, the little islands of crystals. And what was really remarkable about this film is for the top 50 nanometers, there was no sulfur present, which means that we were able to obtain a pure copper and bromide film for 50 nanometers of a thin film. By comparison, perovskite solar cells only need about 25 nanometers of material, so we were able to expose um, the copper sulfide to hydrogen bromide to synthesize a copper bromide film, which is able to be applicable in these solar cells. And we also see that sulfur gradually increases while bromide um, gradually decreases, which means that we can just increase, try to increase the depth of exposure to create more thin films. And so by comparison, direct comparison, we can see that temperature has an effect on this agglomeration property of the film, which means that maybe further investigating temperature would allow us to create more thin films or more uniform films. Um, but in conclusion, we were able to demonstrate a new process to synthesize thin films of metal halides. Not only is this applicable in thin film solar cells, but also this maybe will allow us to fill those white um, periodic table elements into black because we've now developed a process to deposit them by CVD. So I thank 
the, um, my mentors, Professor Gordon, uh, Christina Chang, Rachel Heasley, your work has been, and I've learned so much, it's been phenomenal. Um, all my sponsors, my tutor Sam Beckwell, as well as um, TA Abi for all the help, as RSI, CE, MIT, and Harvard University for this amazing opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Questions from the judges? So you demonstrated really nicely how temperature makes a big difference here. Um, what other parameters besides just temperature and potentially substrate can you think of altering that might improve this process? So the question was, besides temperature and different substrate, what might affect the quality of the film obtained? Um, one thing that could be changed is actually the pressure of the nitrogen carrier gas. So maybe if we like pulse at a higher temperature, things would interact faster. Maybe that would make a, like, the hydrogen bromide depth go further. Or maybe like if we did a slower, the, it, the conversion would be more like thorough as it's like slower. Um, that's definitely one option to explore. This seems like a very, very exciting event for, for the manufacturing. Um, if people want to apply this at scale in, in the existing photovoltaic uh, industry, um, how, how do you foresee this sort of plugging into the existing manufacturing process, and how scalable is this? Yeah, so the question is how scalable CVD processes are in general and how applicable they are to modern thin film solar cell technologies. Um, CVD is actually one of the more scalable technologies for applying thin films because it's, you rely on the chemical reaction. You don't have to create this like really precise like high vacuum beam, which a lot of physical vapor deposition processes use. Um, so it's definitely like more scalable in that sense. And um, as far as applying it to solar cells right now, I'm not certain if any right now use a chemical vapor deposition process, but definitely it would allow us to make more precise thin films, like control the composition even more, increase efficiencies. That's a very impressive result. Thank you. Um, could you comment more on uh, converting that uh, bl white elements to black on extension of that method to other elements that were not, uh, that people couldn't deposit before? Sorry, could you repeat the question? You, uh, the way I understood that, maybe I misunderstood you. You said that your method could be generalized for other elements that were ha ha hard to deposit. Could we just get more information, what elements, what kind of applications, some more insight in that generalization? So we can potentially think about using your method for other applications than solar cells. Yeah, okay, so the question was how can we expand this process to like other elements and also other applications other than solar cells? I, I thought that you mentioned that before, right? Uh, yeah, so um, okay. is that the question? That you, yes, okay. yes, thank you. So as far as materials wise, this process should be extendable to any metal halides, so uh, like the chloride, bromide, iodide family. Um, as far as applications in the industry, um, again, like pharmaceuticals or food processing and even like microelectronics is a big field, like semiconductors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks.